you worship God as mother or father or? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> I like your mother songs. Yeah. Well, I'll be my favorite. This is my favorite mother song. <clears throat>
a little messy. <laughs> All right, so we're on the sixth letter, right? I think so. It's been so long since we've done a class together. Fifteenth class. What's that? Class. This is the fifteenth class. All right. Well, uh, we'll keep going with this on Thursday nights. Probably next Thursday night there won't be a class, but the week from next Thursday night. But you're going to have to keep track of it. It's going to be coming at you from Colorado. So let me uh, let me see if I can get a, a room number for us real quick here on Zoom. I'm sure I've got Zoom on here. All right, we'll have to talk about it after class because it is blocking me from getting in there tonight. It's that two, two system check-in, you know, where they send a message to your phone that you left back in your room. <laughs> All right, so books. All right, so as a reminder, we're going through uh, the, the writings of a Brother Lawrence, who uh, is a great devotee of the divine and uh, deeply in love with God and has made a practice of keeping himself aware of the presence of God at every moment and not forgetting for a split second the presence of divine love, uh, the presence of divine intelligence and grace uh, that fills everything around us when one becomes aware of, <laughs> of those things. And he was saying here, of course, the last paragraph from last week, he said, I do not say, therefore, that we must put any violent constraint upon ourselves. So he's saying not, not to do anything overwhelmingly, uh, you know, violent to yourself in order to be aware of the presence of God, that this is a gentle practice, a constant practice, that when you find your mind wandering from the awareness of the divine during the day, you just gently bring it back. No worries. He says that he never chastised himself. He never went on and, you know, worked out, why did I forget? How could I forget? I'm such an idiot. You know, that's the violence he's saying is not necessary, but that we just constantly bring ourselves back to the divine. And actually he says, no, we must serve God in a holy freedom. We must do our business faithfully without trouble or disquiet, recalling our mind to God mildly and with tranquility, as often as we find it wandering from him. So this notion of God, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be different for different people. Usually in the beginning, when we start a practice like this, God is a third party somewhere far away, you know, some man in the sky, some Michelangelo painting, you know, reaching his finger down, trying to touch our rude little selves. 
But that's, uh, and, and that's fine. You know, initially this conversation with God starts that way. It starts with talking to God. It starts with complaining to God. It starts with just thinking about the divine at all times. And that's fine. Where it's going to go, though, because God always is more intimate than our most intimate thought, is it will move inside of you and the words will go away. And it just becomes this constant play where your prayer becomes what you do. Your prayer becomes what you think. Your prayer becomes what you are. And it's all shared. The heart is always opened to the divine. And that when you come into times where you feel like you need more of a conversation or more of a discussion, that, that it, you can use words, but the words at that level of intimacy are not necessary. You know, that, that you sit there and you just say, Ma, look, see the heart and see what's in there. <laughs> and that, that presence comes to the front. It, it becomes, <laughs> sorry, that song really put me in a space. <laughs> So that, 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 that opening of the heart, that intimacy, that playing with the divine becomes wordless, becomes silent. You know, I always draw that illusion of that day I went to the MoMA in New York City and saw that old couple. <laughs> I mentioned them probably every class. But just sitting there across the table from each other in a very loud cafeteria, saying nothing. They, they must have been in their 90s. I mean, they were, they were you know, <laughs> so old and so sweet looking. And they both had their hand on the table sitting across from each other. And just a finger was touching each other across the table. And it was wordless. And I was sitting there with my friend Sushil, and I was just thinking to myself as I saw that, you know, out of the corner of my eye behind him. And I just thought, how beautiful that is. You know, of course, I made up the whole story. But that's the world, right? That's the world we live in. We've, it's all made up for us anyway. We create our own world. But I saw them sitting there, and I just thought, what is it to be in relationship with somebody for 50, 60, 70 years, possibly even? All the stories have been said. You know, all of the jokes have been made. You know each other so well. There's, you know each other's moods. You know how each other is doing. There's no longer a necessity for doing any of the getting to know each other. Now, just being in the presence of each other is all that's necessary. You know, no conversation. So you can sit there in that, in that loud cacophony of sounds in a MoMA cafeteria and share a moment more intimate than anyone around you could even be aware of without any show, without any demonstration, without any, any particular, just that sweet, that sweet togetherness. And this is what Brother Lawrence is trying to convey to us, that we are in love with love, that the nature of God is love. The nature of God is that deepest wisdom. The nature of God is our very existence. And to move about this world knowing that it's the play of the beloved, knowing that it's the play of the divine, and playing accordingly, living your life accordingly, in that presence, soaking like a rascola in the syrup, you know, those Indian sweets just soaked in syrup. You know, you pick them up, you can squeeze that syrup out of them. And that's what it is to be a devotee of the divine. You know, somebody can just squeeze that love right out of you, just <laughs> pull you out of that little syrup bowl and just give you a hug and, and it just comes out. And we see that in some of the great swamis that have come through this place. He goes on, he says, it is, however, necessary to put our whole trust in God. Now, that's a beautiful thing here. He says, put your whole trust in God, laying aside all other cares and even some particular forms of devotion, though very good in themselves, yet such as one often engages in unreasonably because they are de these devotions are only for a means to attain the end. So he's saying there, be sure that the practice doesn't become the point. 
you know, that's that's how you become a, tr you know, that Saturday Night Live church lady. Do you remember? <laughs> that's when the practice becomes more important than the relationship, right? When you start becoming proud of the work that you're doing to to dance with love, you know, and you somehow lose that love. You see, <laughs> you, you become that that haughty religious person, you know, who's looking around to see who's sitting where on Sunday morning. Is anybody breaking any rules, you know, that I can deliciously attack? So not to, so to put away those things, keep them in the back seat, but work on this trust of God. This trust of God is of utmost importance. It's that it's the root of everything, that faith in God. And what is this faith? This faith is that God is enough. The faith is that this love is true enough. The faith is that God's love is complete. There's nothing about you that is unacceptable to the divine. Nothing. There's nothing in you that God cannot deal with, that God demands an end to even. We see that in the life of Girish Ghosh, you know, that that playwright, famous and wonderful and respectful as he is in our memory, at the time he was an alcoholic. And he would show up at the Dakshinishwar temple, you know, that reeking of alcohol, <laughs> dropping his bottle in the cab on the way in. To see, his, to see his teacher, his guru, Ramakrishna. And it was always so fascinating to me that Ramakrishna never told him to quit drinking, never told him that, it needed to, you know, that he needed to stop behave, never threw him out. Even when the devotees rose up and said, why are you letting this guy in here? He's disrupting everything. He's disrespectful to you. He stinks like alcohol. And Ramakrishna defends him and says, you know nothing. You cannot see anything of what God sees in him. This man's faith, you know, this man's love for the divine. Because look, he gets drunk and where does he come? <laughs> he comes to the temple, you know. Where does he go? And this is that kind of trust that Brother Lawrence is talking about. It's like we should never forget the thought of God because of our unworthiness or because of our lack of accomplishment or because of our wrong idea of who we are. Because God sees in you the image of herself or himself that he, they, she put there at your birth. And that is the love that's reflected. He sees you in your realization, even if you don't. He sees you in your perfection, even if you can't. That is love. That's the nature of love. And that's the nature of the presence of God, is to have that constant confidence within ourselves of this unending presence, this beautiful notion of love that is the source and motivating force in everything that moves in this universe everything that changes. He says that we must, <clears throat> so when by this exercise of the presence of God, we are with him who is our end, it is then useless to return to the means, but we may continue with him our commerce of love, persevering in his holy presence, one while, one while by an act of praise, of adoration or of desire, one while by an act of resignation or thanksgiving, and in all the ways which our spirit can invent. Now, well, that's one of my favorite things right there, <laughs> to remind you that you have the freedom to invent in this relationship with the divine. You don't have to worship God like anybody else worships God. You don't have to think of God in the same way as anybody else thinks of God. You and God have been together your whole life, you know, that, that wonderful, I sound like a broken record sometimes with my examples, but that wonderful memory of Rabia in her poem, who complains that she has called out to God for her whole life and he never answered. And she was sitting there one day wondering, why has he not answered? Why can he not hear me? And she thought to herself, maybe I've used the wrong name. <laughs> and so she says in her poem that she, she made up a name for God. And then the last line of the poem is, and that has made all the difference. And so I encourage you, you know, to be inventive in how you remember God, in how you think of God. You know, be inventive for the of the things you put in your day to remind you about the divine. 
you know, you can be the person who puts the rubber band on there. I, there was a woman in, in an accounting office that I worked in decades ago who was trying to quit smoking. And so any time the thought of smoking came, she pulled this rubber band way out and just <laughs> snapped her wrist with it to kind of try and divert her thoughts from going in that direction. So you can get that way, although that might fall under the category of violent. <laughs> Who knows? But you know, you can, you, can, you can do all kinds of little things, leave little notes, little names of God, you know, in front of the toaster, in front of the microwave, on the knob of the TV set, taped on the back of your phone, on the background of your phone. Whatever it is, just things that are helpful for you, especially in the beginning of this practice. You know, remember it took him 15 years of continual effort before he said that he reached that point where he could not forget the presence of God. And not just as a thought, that he began to experience the presence of God and that the subtle movements of God became aware, became apparent to him within. Because it's God who breathes in you. You know, it's one of my favorite things about this idea of the Garden of Eden that we've talked about in the past and that how in Vedanta it says the world is created new every moment, you know, that, that, that it wasn't created long ago, that it's actually recreated every moment. And so when I went through that study of the, the story of the Garden of Eden in the Christian scripture and imagined it being a statement about our constant condition, you know, about that it's replayed every moment, that we're eating that apple every moment, you know, and exerting our will and going against the divine will and, and exerting our kingship within this realm of our ego and leaving them outside. But then it goes even further. I took it even farther back and thought, well, what about the creation of, of us when God created us? You know, if, it's, if that happens every moment, if the world is created every moment, I'm created every moment. And when God says he breathed the breath of life into the human form, you know, in the case of Adam and Eve, when he breathed the life into their nostrils, I thought, oh my God, wait, that's incredible. Every time that I take an inhalation, that is my creation. That is God breathing the breath of life into my nostrils and creating me anew, brand new, every moment. And the beauty of that is that that, that helps us to, to do this task of getting rid of the idea of the past, the story that defines the present for us, right? Because God is the I am, is it not? Remember that? God is this present moment. And we can't see this present moment because we have our past defining it all the time, or we have our hopes for the future distracting us from it all the time. But God is here. God is this moment. The existence that you experience in this moment is God, Satchit Ananda. He's that experience of that being, that isness that you are, that you have. Anytime you talk about yourself, you say the name of God first, right? I'm hungry. Who's hungry? I am is hungry, you know? I'm tired. Who's tired? I am is tired, right? And did not God say that's his name in the Old Testament of the, the Christian scriptures? So every time you describe something about yourself, you use the name of God. We should become aware of this. This is what Brother Lawrence is telling us. Be aware of the obvious. Wake up again to the newness, to the richness of this experience of the divine. Don't let yourself be lulled to sleep by assuming anything about this profound, intense, amazing experience of being, of existence. Walk in the thrill of that. Remember the thrill of that in all the ways which your spirit can invent, in all the ways you can think of doing that. Be not discouraged by the repugnance which you may find in it from your nature. <laughs> That's a nice way of saying it. Don't be discouraged by your repugnance. <laughs> you know, anytime in the Christian scriptures, the Christians always define mankind by his post-fall, right? In Vedanta, we talk about mankind, womankind, us-kind. We talk about us-kind before the fall, that our nature is, is pure, that we are divine, that we are of God, that we are, in fact, the divine itself. But when, when the Christians talk about it, they define themselves post-fall. So when they use those harsh words like, don't be discouraged by your repugnance, <laughs> they're talking about the ego self. And it's not a bad thing to think that way about the ego self, because the ego self is what has deprived you of joy. 
It what it's what has deprived you of seeing and experiencing love in a constant flow like this. It's the ego that is the veil, the scriptures say. Ramakrishna says it is the ego that is the veil that prevents you from seeing the divine in this moment. It's what has ceased or prevented you from being realized, from enjoying your realization. And so we should have that attitude about our ego self. We should have that idea of our ego self, that it is repugnant, because one day we'll feel that way about it when we've stopped identifying with it. Right now we don't like to call it that because we, we think we're that. <laughs> like, I am that ego. I don't like to be called repugnant. Thank you. <laughs> but, but in fact, you're not. But your ego is repugnant. You are ever free, ever blissful, ever divine. But be not discouraged by the repugnance which you may find in it from your nature. You must do yourself violence. At the first one, often, at first, one often thinks it is lost time, but you must go on. You must resolve to persevere in it, even to death, notwithstanding all the difficulties that may occur. I recommend myself to the prayers of your holy society and yours in particular. I am in our Lord, yours, Brother Lawrence. So that's the end of that letter, and he's just telling you, don't be discouraged. Don't give up. You know, 15 years. He gives two times in there. He says that at 15 years, he had become constantly aware of God. So it might take you 15 years. Don't be discouraged. Give yourself 15 years. That 15 years is going to pass anyway, whether you work on it or not. So don't see it as a long time. You know, I'm at that age where I'm constantly laughing about my age, constantly, <laughs> constantly being amazed. I have a new one to share. If I was walking in the Garden of the Gods, this park outside of Colorado Springs, and I had been there before. I, I lived, I went to like third grade, third and fourth grade with Mrs. Manning and Mrs. Bouchard in, uh, <laughs> at Queen Palmer Elementary School. I went to school there, and we used to go on Sunday afternoons and play in the Garden of the Gods. And so I was sitting there trying to think of when the last time that I was there, <laughs> and oh my God, it was 50 years ago. It was the first time in my life that I could say to myself that I remembered something that happened 50 years ago. And I just had to stop. Of course, I was walking with my friend Greg and just start laughing. I was like, oh, my God. If it wasn't for some semblance of spiritual life, this thought would have destroyed me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> 50 years. So don't be discouraged by these things that you've mistaken for your nature, he's saying. Don't be discouraged by this ego self, by 50 years. Don't be discouraged by the effort it's taking, because that time is going to pass anyway. And if it hasn't been done until now, so what? Now is the time. That's the beauty of being recreated every moment. That's the beauty of being able to set aside your history. That's the beauty of, of, of being in the now, being present in God, because you are always new, always forgiven, always free, always able to be what you are, that you don't have to be defined by the past or by your desires for the future. Be present. That's where God is. Letter number seven. Oh my, this is interesting. Have you ever started a letter with this sentence? I pity you much. <laughs> Let's see where he's going with this. I pity you much. It will be of great importance if you can leave the care of your affairs to somebody and spend the remainder, the remainder of your life only in worshiping God. He requires no great matters of us, a little remembrance of him from time to time, a little adoration, sometimes to pray for his grace, sometimes to offer him your sufferings, sometimes to return to him thanks for the favors he's given you and still gives you in the midst of your troubles and to console yourself with him as often as you can. So he's talking to somebody like us <laughs> just starting out. You know, I pity you. <laughs> You've got 15 years ahead of you. 
and you don't get the joys that I've had. You know, he, he mentions the, the two times that he mentions that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. This is the 15 years. That was until he was able to master the constant thought of the presence of God. And then he says later another number, 30 years. And at 30 years, do anybody remember what's happened at 30 years? Exactly, yes. He has an inner joy that is so deep and so profound that he has to disguise it so that people don't think he's nuts. <laughs> he walks around giggling all the time in the presence of his God. His relationship with God has become so deep and so fun that it's literally, literally laughing and giggling and being overwhelmed with happiness, with overwhelmed with joy. And so, you know, from that perspective, he's looking at us. He's like, there's, he, and he genuinely feels it. You know, he feels this pity for us because he sees the struggling and he knows the potential in you. You know, he looks at you and sees that you can't get over your ego. You can't get past your faults. You can't get past your shortcomings. He sees that. And he feels that pity, that sorry, that sorry of sorrowfulness for you. It's like, gosh, if I could give it to you, I would. If I could bring you here for a moment, I would do it. You know, and he can't. But he's saying, you know, just do what you can do. That's it. Do what you can do and move forward. Just keep going forward. We have that wonderful story in the scriptures. Just go forward. Don't stop at the little things. You know, sometimes we, <laughs> because we're so starved for any of this kind of understanding of the divine or of God, that a lot of times in the beginning you'll get a little zap of something, you know, you'll have a great meditation and and then you'll go looking for it, you know, every other meditation after that. And, and you might find it. It might become a regular thing. Don't be content with that. Don't stop there. Don't ever let your practice become routine, become boring to you, become something that you just have to do every morning or every night or every afternoon. Keep it alive. Keep it inventive. Keep it, keep it inspiring. Always come to the heart when you sit before God. You know, when you go into the shrine or when you go to your chair or wherever it is that you do your practice, you should always remember at that moment when you're sitting down that this could be the day where you finally let go of the ego and see your beloved for the first of many, 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 many times. That this is the potential. Because this moment, they say that, that our realization is the only thing that doesn't have a cause. It's the only effect with no cause. And so it can happen. You may not have to wait 15 years. It may be that you did 15 years in your last life, <laughs> and now you've only got three more days. But always sit with that anticipation. Don't get rusty. Don't get bored. Don't get rote in your effort. Always keep the heart exercised, open, and alive in this quest for God. So we give them a little adoration and sometimes pray for grace and sometimes to offer him your suffering. Lift up your heart to him, sometimes even at your meals and when you are in company. The least little remembrance will always be acceptable to him. You need not cry very loud. He is nearer to us than we are aware of. All right? What does the master say? He says two things in there. He says, God is closer than what body part? <laughs> Anybody know? God is closer to you than your... Nope. Nope. Good. Your neck. <laughs> I don't know why he chose the neck. But he said, God is closer to you than your neck. Uh, okay. That's pretty close. And then what was the animal or the, the insect? He says, God is so close that he can hear the anklets on an ant. <laughs> That's how close God is. And so know that intimacy. At those times when God seems far away, God hasn't gone anywhere. God has not left you. You know, God, God, you have turned your eyes away. You've paid attention to something else. But God is just as close as ever. You don't have to go begging him to come back and think that's something you need to do to bring him back. It's not him we're bringing back. <laughs> it's ourselves that we're bringing back to reminding, reminding ourselves that we're in that, that beautiful presence, that we're in that space. 
and to not uh, to not get into this strange thing that sometimes happens when we t when we take the divine, which in in the highest reality isn't personal, you know, isn't isn't individual because God is all. God is everything. He's you, me, everything. There's nothing that is not divine. In that form, he's not personal. So when he becomes personal for us, a lot of times the first thing we make the mistake of doing is slapping our idea of personality onto him or her or that. And so God can get angry and God can get fussed and God can pout and <laughs> you know, all that stuff. And it's tempting to do that. And that's fine to do that. But you can't take that seriously. You can't think that God has gone away and isn't going to come back or that you are so unworthy he's never going to see you again. You can't go there because it's untrue. You couldn't exist if God had gone anywhere, right? God is Satchitananda, existence, knowledge, and bliss, existence, knowledge, and love. So your existence is your proof. We've talked about that many times, but to remind you that God is present because you're present. If God went, you would go. <laughs> you, would, you would pop out like a bubble. So lift up your heart to him, sometimes even at your meals, you know, at all times, because this relationship is internal. God and you, what you think is you, exist within yourself, you know, and that conversation happens within yourself. That encouragement happens within yourself. The inspiration happens within yourself. And this lifting your heart to God, what is that? That's just allowing, consciously allowing awareness to enter the deepest parts of you, to hold nothing back. Don't hide anything. Don't protect yourself in any way. Lift your heart to God and let the divine see everything in there, all of it, all of it, because she was there when you did it. <laughs> she was present through every bit of it, and she's still present. She has not left you. She has not ceased your existence. So lift up your heart to God in that confidence, in that faith, in that knowing, that love, that God doesn't go away. God doesn't give up. God doesn't end the relationship. That's for us to do, all right? It is not necessary for being with God to be always at church. <laughs> We may make an oratory of our heart wherein to retire from time to time to converse with him in meekness, humility, and love. Everyone is capable of such familiar conversation with God, some more and some less. He knows what we can do. Let us begin then. Perhaps he expects but one generous resolution on our part. Have courage. We have but little time to live. You are near 64. Ah, somebody older. You are near 64, and I'm almost 80. Let us live and die with God. Sufferings will be sweet and pleasant to us while we are with him, and the greatest pleasures will be, without him, a cruel punishment to us. May he be blessed for all. Amen. So he's saying there, you know, just give your time to the divine. He maybe is just expecting one generous resolve on your part. That's something that he mentions again and again, and I think it's the key to this practice, that resolve to do this. I will never forget God. I will never wander from the thought or the awareness that God is present. To make that resolution, you might have to make it over and over again, you know, but you just keep doing it. That's the nature of grace. That's the nature of that wind that's always blowing. It won't leave you behind. Any time you put that sail up, the wind is blowing. Even if that sail has toppled several times, you put it up again, and the same wind is blowing. So don't cease. Keep going. Because he says here that, that if you have this awareness of the divine, it gives meaning to every moment. It gives, it gives depth to every moment. It makes everything profound. You know, you can have the dullest job in the dullest accounting office at the most hideous ordinary cubicle in the world. And if you are there in the presence of God, you will know that you're not an accountant, that you're a lover, 
and you go to work not to crunch numbers, but to love your neighbor. So you're the one that people come to in the office because you're there to love, you're there to serve, you're there to care. And so we remember that when we're in the presence of God because that's his attitude toward ourself. And to always keep that in our mind, that this resolution is at the center of our life. I will walk every step of this life with God. I will not take a single step alone. It will not happen. Accustom yourself then, by degrees, thus to worship him, to beg his grace, to offer him your heart from time to time in the midst of your business, so he's emphasizing this, not in church, you know, not in your, <laughs> not that you don't do it then also, but a church and a temple and a shrine and an image are not necessary for this. The image of God is in the heart. And to sit in the shrine of the heart is where we meditate. That's where we go. And we can go there all the time. Actually, the ideal is to never leave there, to sit in the middle of that peace to sit in the middle of the stillness, that unchanging part of you, you know, that unchanging part of you that has been there through every step of your life, that, that you, the eye of the eye, the eye that recognizes you, even though your body has changed so much, even though your mind is changing even in this moment, that constant sense of me, of I, that's God. That's the presence of God in you. It doesn't move, it doesn't change. And what we have to do in our life is shift our center of awareness from the changing to this unchanging notion. Now, how does that happen? What is the thing that changes all the time? It's the mind. And that's where we live. It's the mind that keeps the idea of past. It's mind that has the concept of future. Because in reality, we've never experienced the past. We've never experienced a future. We only have experienced now. That's the only thing we've ever had. The mind has taken that and stretched it into a timeline because that's the world of change. The mind is constantly in change. And we live in that change all the time. We're sitting in that change. We're enamored of that change. We love the, that change. And we get caught up in that change. And so we suffer because we're going around the washing machine of life, just going churn, 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 spin, spin, turn, turn, around and around. Your job is to step out of mind and witness it. See it, but know it is not you. That's not a hard thing to do. It's not a philosophical thing to do. It's understanding reality, because it's what you do all the time. You watch your mind. Your mind talks to you. Obviously, you're not the mind if it's talking to you. It's reflecting what spontaneously is happening here. But that reflection is unnecessary. Live in the spontaneous side. And don't, don't calculate the moment. Don't calculate an action. Don't have your action be a reaction to what is. Have your action be a response to what is. And the what is is your nature of love, your nature of compassion, your nature of beauty, your nature of immortality. Learn to sit in that silent space that we've forgotten, that we've ignored almost completely because we like the flash and glam of change. So change your center of thought and move into that stability, move into that silent space where everything is fine, where everything is beautiful and perfect as it should be. And respond to the world. Don't react to the world. So accustom yourself by degrees to worship him and beg his grace to offer him your heart from time to time in the midst of your business, even every moment if you can. Do not always scrupulously confine yourself to certain rules. All right. Vivekananda had a wonderful way of dealing with that, right? <laughs> he said you should break one rule every day <laughs> to prevent ego right? To prevent the idea of being a good person. Because being a good person is an ego identity. Being a religious person, being close to God, having any idea of yourself. If you see an idea of yourself, break it. Separate yourself from that because you can't be put in a box. So stop being put in a box. 
Stop taking these momentary adjectives of who you are. Stop defining yourself by that because they change constantly. You know, shave your head. Now you're bald. You're not that person with beautiful hair anymore, but you're still that person, right? Put on a hideous pair of shoes, you know, walk backwards down the street. Just do things to remind you that you are infinite, that you can't be defined, that you're not this, that, or the other. You're all of it. And you, in your truth, are living everyone's life, all right? Because you are every person. That which is you is the same that which is you in everyone. It's not different. There's one I that's manifesting as all of us. That's your nature. That ability to empathize, that ability to, to, to change identity, right? Did, did we, I don't know if this is more recent or not, but I was fascinated by that idea in a dream. I woke up from a dream many times. <laughs> But the idea that in a dream, you know, because we think about, oh, well, if I lived another life, how is it that I can't remember it? That seems so unlikely. How come I have no memory of my past life? You know, it doesn't seem reasonable. You know, how can I not be this body? I mean, this body is so close to me. But in fact, every night when you go in and you dream, you become this new person in a dream who doesn't remember anything about the guy or woman laying in the bed sleeping. You don't remember anything about your current life, let alone your past life. So you see how the mind is fully able to block out an entire life on the spot when you take this dream. And not only that, you've now taken a butterfly body in your dream. You've just flown up onto a cliff without thinking anything weird about it at all. You see, it's your nature to be whatever you want to be. It's your nature to identify with anything you want to identify with. You can be instantly a butterfly <laughs> and your, your mind won't argue with you at all. It doesn't. Look at your dream. Look at the bodies you take up in your dreams. You take on a new body. You let go of your old life. You let go of all of those old experiences and you become something new for a dream, for a night. It's no different in this life. You are only incidentally what you think you are at this moment. You've been many things. Even in this life, you've been many things, you know? So don't, don't get stuck in the rules, in the definitions, in the grind. Always keep that child in you playing. Keep that child in you imagining and loving and being free. Do not always scrupulously confine yourself to certain rules or particular forms of devotion but act with a general confidence in God. That's that faith, that confidence that God is with you, that confidence that God is love, that it can't be violated. You know? Now that doesn't, that of course we have to say, <laughs> don't take license, let it be natural. Don't do rude things on God just, to, just because you can. <laughs> you know, don't, don't abuse the relationship. You know, of course there's room for that too, if you're angry. You know, or if things aren't going your way, it's fine. It's fine to give God a good finger shaking every now and then. But don't get confined. Don't get stuck. <laughs> with a general confidence in God, with love and humility, you may assure blank of my poor prayers and that I am their servant and particularly yours in our Lord. A beautiful letter there that he's telling us wonderful things in there. Let us live and die with God. Yeah, you know, I did an exercise, I don't know, it was about a month ago. It's a weird exercise. I, you might try it if you want to be weird, but I laid, <laughs> I, I laid in, I was laying in my bed and I was sort of falling asleep. And I just had this thought like, what if I tried to imagine myself at like 98 years old, you know, and that my body has come to the point where I can't get out of this bed. And that this room, you know, my dorm room is good, is my whole world, you know, that I can't, which is not a far fetched thought at all. You know, I watched Swami Asitananda in San Francisco where he sat in an easy chair and that was his whole world. That was everything. He couldn't get out of it. He got his food there, you know, <laughs> everything. Let your mind wander. Everything happened in that big chair. 
and he was always content. I would check in on him because that was my job as a brahmachari, was to check in to make sure that he was still fine. And so I would walk by his room several times a day and just kind of glance in without bothering him. And he was always sitting there with this sweet, just kind of un nondescript smile on his face. He always had those watery red eyes of someone who's seen something beautiful. And he was always kind of just like looking off. And he wasn't unconscious. He wasn't unaware. He was fully focused on something that I couldn't see, something that I didn't know. But I marveled at the fact that this man had learned something that kept him in peace and kept him in a positive and beautiful state of mind when there was nothing there to do it for him. You know, and that's that was one of my first impressions of monasticism. I was like, that's why I'm going to do this. I want that ability to be wherever I am, doing whatever I'm doing, and to have that holy shrine just emanating that bliss, that joy of life, that joy of being. And so that that is what he's giving to us here. That's what he's pointing to. For us here. So, so I was laying in my bed thinking about this. <laughs> I'm only 57. I'm forgetting what I'm saying. So I was laying in bed and I was trying to go through this exercise. I was like, okay, you're 98. You can't get up. You're never going to be able to get up again. You're going to lay here in this bed until the body goes. And I really tried to absorb that and I tried to ask myself very plainly, is that okay? Can, can you be okay here in this bed and never getting up again, never seeing outside again until death comes? And I sat there thinking about it and I thought, well, let me see. Can I find a place in myself right now that's acceptable, that I enjoy being? And that's the question for you every moment. That's how we come to the presence of God. That's how we come to the awareness of God because it's only with the awareness of God that a situation so dismal as that could be enjoyed, could be blissful, could even be beautiful. And not just beautiful, but inspiring. Because unknowingly, he inspired me, doing nothing but sitting in an easy chair. He inspired me and gave me a thought about the divine that was deep and beautiful. And that's what will happen to you in the presence of God if you learn to carry that shrine within you and become aware of it all the time, you can do the simplest thing and somebody will be inspired by it. Somebody will be lifted by it. This is what it is to know the divine. <laughs> this is what it is to be what you are, to understand the nature of life, to become aware of something you forgot many, many, many years ago, and to give yourself that opportunity at every moment to be new, to be fresh, to be free, to be pure, to be lovely, to be inspirational. That's walking in the presence of God. So we must do these things. Now I'm going to try something. I want to find a way to give you a Anyway, if you go to Monkotronic on YouTube, that's the, the video channel, I will do a video this work, kind of this week, kind of outlining uh, the ways that we can keep, keep doing this uh, together. And uh, like I said, it, well, I'm going to do it next, next Thursday night, even if it's horrifically bizarre. So next Thursday, there will be a class. And you can find that class at Monkotronic on Yahoo, uh, on, on YouTube, sorry, youtube.com. Okay, under Monkotronic. And so the, this class will go on. And there's also a class on, um, uh, it's a Buddhist oriented class on uh, Zen mind, beginner's mind. That's on Thursday mornings. So that, that will also continue there. And then there's going to be Sunday lectures there also for the for a group in Colorado where I'm going. So uh, anybody who wants to be a part of those things is welcome to be a part of those things. Are you, are you going to go for the extended period? Yes. 
who knows? Let, let these things unfold. But yes, I'll be going. I'll be going next next uh, Wednesday. So there. Uh, Boulder or near Boulder, a little town called Lafayette. <laughs> We've been discussing it. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. Yeah. No, we're going to do in the spring. We're going to do a meditation retreat also. So I'll I'll put those dates out for yeah, things. Yes, it's true. It wouldn't be hard to do that either. My heart is killing me at going. But anyway, it's a new idea, a new a new attempt. And, uh, you know, nothing changes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Very good. Any questions? Comments? Concerns? You said you put something in the uh, activity that you were facing uh, that would be make it memorable. Uh, I was reading something today, I think it was Buddhist, but whatever, I was supposed to like what we do here. And it said, always make something artistic in it. Mm. It keeps the mind interested and, and keeps it going, makes it work. Yes. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, God is obviously an artist, you know, very obviously beautiful. And so we, we are too. And so we live that way. <laughs> You're killing me, Alex. Stop. <laughs> but uh, um, no, that's the point of life. I mean, it's God is constantly creating. I mean, every day is is. Uh, is a new, you know, I mean, you, we can get sappy. You can say a new sunset, a new sunrise. There's a new flower. There's a new rock sitting in just the right place. There's a new fountain that you stumble on. It's like God is always creating this beauty. And I think that that's so much what that relationship with the divine is, is to, to be in that constant state of freshness, that constant state of, of newness, of beauty, and to, to make your life art, you know, make your life your painting, make your life your sculpture, make your life, everything that you do, the way that you do it, give it that flair, give it that special touch of devotion, that special uh, you. <laughs> That divine nature. The sunset, that uh, thing that you say, put your eye on, and be aware of these things. Actually, that is God. Everything is one in a sense. Yeah. Um, that's that's why they, we always I, I always try and figure out why is everything love? Or God is love. Everything is love. But when you see some of these things and you realize you're looking at God, then you realize. It opens. It is love. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it yeah. Everything is love, and that's you know one of my, it's one of my, one of the most difficult truths, but one of my favorite truths that Swamiji says that that um, every, that love is the only motivating factor in the universe. You know, that that is a beautiful meditation because there's horrific things going on. You know, you think you you walk by that person that's homeless on the street and suffering terribly. And, uh, you know, in, <laughs> this is a totally non-politically correct example, but here we go. Um, you know, high on drugs. And it's like, it's completely ruined life. And we see the ruined life and we see the starving on the sidewalk. And we're like, where is love in this? How can God let this happen? And yet it's that man's love for what his experience is with that drug that has brought all of the rest of this. And so all of this suffering is love seen from the other side. You know, it's, it's, it's love seen from a different perspective. But we all make choices, and those choices are for what we love, for what we desire, for what we long for. And if we're in ignorance, not knowing who we are, we do things that serve a body, but don't serve a soul. We do things that serve a mind, but don't serve a soul. 
And if we create a life that serves a body and serves a mind, but doesn't serve our, ourself, this unchanging nature within, that life can become hideous, that life can become full of pain, can become full of suffering. But that's the beauty of it. You are new at every moment. You can accept what you've done. You can accept what you've seen. You don't resist it. You accept it and see it in full awareness. And that is what renews us. That's what changes us. It's that presence, that awareness, that seeing, that objectivity of the divine, of seeing it without a history and seeing it without a future, but seeing it now as it is. It's that ability that changes us, that transforms us, that brings us to transcendence. It's that uh, presence of God, which is exactly what that is, that allows us to become what we are, allows us to be the, <laughs> allows us to be our obituary.